Well, with all the scandals going on and the internal memos that are being passed around corporate enterprises and startups alike, it seems like culture is in the news again. Let's talk about it, guys. Welcome, everybody, to Venture Daily, your daily show for venture capitalists, founders, entrepreneurs, and the techno curious. <laughs> The techno curious guys, we have three things that we're going to be going over today. We're going to be going over a piece of news talking about culture, some a culturally relevant article, and then we're going to be talking about venture deals of the day. Today's December 11th. It's Wednesday, guys. And then we're going to do a new segment. A new segment mostly because of Jason. Thanks, Jason out there, one of my subscribers. He asked a great question, so we're going to be doing a new segment today, Ask Peter or Something like that. Let's get into it, guys. Today's news article is six signs your corporate culture is a liability with all the stuff going around. Um, what's that one? Away, the away bags and the internal memos of corporate cultures being toxic. It seems like culture is once again in the news. This one's by Sarah Clayton. It may be unfair to dub 2019 the year of corporate misconduct. 2008 was a real doozy, but we've certainly seen a lot of it. In fact, one in five employees report experiencing a cultural crisis. A cultural crisis. Yo, that, that sounds rough, guys. A cultural crisis. It's a good thing I'm out of the corporate world. A significant incident in indicative of troubling workplace attitudes and behaviors in their organization in the last year or two. What's more, an even greater percentage of employees, 30%, expect ex to experience a cultural crisis, such as sexual harassment, gender discrimination, financial mismanagement, cheating of customers, inattention to safety, or poor behavior in the leadership ranks in the next two years based on their perceptions of their employer's behavior. United Minds Research, conducted this fall in partnership with KRC Research, also shows that 28% of employees strongly agree that there is alignment between their company's actions and its stated values, a finding that should give us all pause. Let's undo this, guys. The reality is that culture, which often th is thought of as a company's most precious asset, maybe we should define culture first. Let me go first. I define culture very simply. Culture is the conglomeration of all the behaviors of your company. Yeah, that's it. So if we, if we want to make that even easier to understand, each team, for example, a software development team, has a unique culture. That culture is all the, all the different behaviors of those team members. That creates the standards of culture for that team. Now, if the overwhelming majority of those engineers are salty and pissy, then yeah, you're going to have a pretty crappy team culture. The reality is that culture, which often thought is the company's most precious asset, is increasing a li increasingly a liability for companies that don't attend to it. Continued advocacy around quote, hashtag me too, new levels of scrutiny from investors and regulators, and increased activism on social media are forcing boards and CEOs to be accountable for culture in the ways they haven't been before. I, I find this to be a bit fascinating um, that, well, let's put it this way. The culture wars will always continue rise and, you know, rise and fall, ebb and flow with big blow ups from big companies that have big dysfunctions from their leaders. So this is always going to happen. But what I find novel is that leaders, especially a lot of the leaders, I assume, are reading about these these issues are reading about these articles, so they should know better. Culture, and I've stated this before many times as a consultant, culture really starts at the top. Against this backdrop, many of our clients are very deliberately asking themselves, what about our culture is putting us at risk? And more than half has told us that they are committed to strengthening and evolving their cultures as a business priority in 2020. To their credit, they have embraced embracing a proactive approach to this particular type of risk management, an approach we call, quote, cultural vigilance. Wow, it's fascinating that we have to have all these new monikers and words and phrases just to behave right. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I was kind of raised with just being respectful, being nice, being honest, even if it's hurtful. <laughs> just be honest, man. 
How, so how do organizations make the shift from reactive cultural cleanup to proactive cultural vigilance? We asked ourselves the exact question earlier this year. We began by polling Weber Shandwick's global community of crisis practitioners. I didn't know there was such a thing. Cha-ching. Clearly there's money in it. Asking them questions like, what conditions precipitate the cultural crisis you've worked on? What have you uh, seen on the front lines? That led to a deep literature review and a national survey of 1,000 full-time employees who are 18 years or older and work for companies with 500 employees or more. Our aim was to gather as many research-based indicators of cultural risk as possible and test them to determine which are most predictive. Of all the indicators that organizations measure, track, and assess, we wanted to know which factors mattered most. Using a statistical technique to analyze our survey data, we narrowed the list to six items that gather account that together account for the majority of cultural risk. When employees agree that their company is not being vigilant in one or more of these areas, listed below in order of predictive power, a cultural crisis may be looming. You know what's fascinating is that they've created these entire frameworks now to help you understand whether your culture is at risk. You know what would be really interesting? Actually, probably the easiest thing to do is as a leader of a company, just sit down and ask your management. Ask your VPs, your directors, your executives, ask your managers. Ask them, how's our culture? What's going on with our culture? And get feedback from them. You don't need a framework for this, but you know what? Let's see what these guys have to say. Risk number one is inadequate investment in people. This makes a lot of sense. This is the factor most predictive of cultural risk. And so it follows that an investment in your employees is an investment in a healthy culture and ultimately in better business outcomes. When employees join a company, they are entered into what is often called a people deal, where they receive compensation, career development, and various benefits in exchange for the work they do. Captain Obvious. When employees perceive that their employers aren't give, living up to their end of the deal, they're less inclined to live up to theirs. It's a two-way highway, guys. Two-way street. Often becoming disengaged, displaying passive-aggressive behavior, or letting work quality slip. When these conditions exist at scale, companies very quickly become vulnerable. You got it. Number two, risk. Lack of accountability. One third of survey respondents believe their company doesn't consistently hold people responsible for misconduct. When employees are under the impression that there is no consequences or that consequences are handed out unevenly, they may use it at both as a justification for not reporting poor behavior, why bother, and as a reason to be less careful about their own actions. Doubt about the company's commitment to its values creeps in and, quote, see something, say something mentality that defines collective cultural stewardship often falls by the wayside. Number three, lack of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The hashtag MeToo movement was a much needed wake up call for corporate America. I'll leave it there. And let me know. Let me know your comments on the Me Too movement. I think there's pros and cons to the Me Too movement. I think there's obviously it's great to elevate the the idea that hey, look, we need equity within everything. Uh, but you know these types of movements people can tend to take too far. Let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on the hashtag Me Too movement. With matters of sexual harassment and gender discrimination at the fore, more than half of companies revisited their policies while others appointed diverse board members, established diversity and inclusion, quote, DNI councils, strengthened their employee resource groups, and tackled non inclusive ways of working. While we can't know how many crises have been averted because of these efforts, we do know that la the lack of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace is the third most predictive indicator of cultural risk. So here's the real question. What's the threshold required uh, when it comes to diversity? Like, what is that number? Is it 20% that we're diverse? 30%, 50%, 100%? Like, how do you, what, what's, what's the appropriate level of diversity? That's, that's the one thing that I always wonder about these types of things is like, what's the actual measuring rod? What, 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 what's acceptable? What, what would, would move us from dysfunction to functional? Maybe you guys have ideas. Leave comments below. As uh, recently as last summer, diversity leaders are still identifying organizational culture, organizational culture as the number one challenge standing in the way of their objectives. Risk number four is poor behavior at the top. Yes, it's always behavior at the top. 
We all know that employees take their cues from those in authority, which is why it's not surprising that poor behavior at the top is also a predictor of cultural risk. Executives under intense pressure to deliver results and far too many are rewarded on what they achieve without factoring how they achieved it. According to our survey, almost one third of employees say that their leaders don't behave in consistent ways consistent with company values. 100% guys, 100%. Um, as, a, as a previous consultant, I guess I'm still a consultant here. Nope. Nope. As a previous consultant, I will tell you that when it comes to culture and defining culture, what defines your culture are the behaviors at the top. Let me put it this way. What defines your culture, listen in guys, what defines your culture are the behaviors at the top. Whatever you allow, whatever type of dysfunctional behavior that you allow, that you, that you allow to be acceptable at the top, is going to have downstream implications to the entire organization. If your leadership is a jerk, it affects the entire organization, baby. Come on now, come on now. Like, I'm, all, I'm always encouraging leaders, especially if you're a self-proclaimed leader or your actual leader, it doesn't matter. Be a good, be a good guy, be a good person. You know, geez, Louise. I, just, I find it fascinating that we have to read articles about these things. But anyway, I guess it's a good reminder. <sighs> According to our survey, almost one-third of employees say that the leaders don't behave in ways consistent with company values. 2018 saw a string of CEO departures for all impropriety, including the chiefs of Barnes & Noble, the CBS, and Lululemon. Aw, I like Lululemon. I do. Nope. <laughs> so significant was this trend for the first time in 19 years that the number one reason CEOs were ousted from their jobs was not p poor financial performance, but ethical lapses. Golly, there are issues at the top. According to PwC, it found that 39% of CEOs who left their jobs in 2018 left for reasons related to unethical behavior stemming from allegations of sexual misconduct or ethical lapses connected to things like fraud, bribery, and insider trading. Boards are to be credited for making tough decisions to put values above all else when CEOs misbehave. I am, I will say, I'm actually really encouraged. This is a, this is a good thing. This is a good thing that more and more people are being assertive about voicing what's going on in organizations so that these organizations can be better for the world. Number five, uh, high pressure environments. Okay, shouldn't you have kind of known that the environment was high pressure when you joined? High pressure environments are yet another predictor of cultural risk. I mean, if you're a, if you're a startup and you're a founder, your entire company is in, is in war mode. You're not in peacetime mode, you're in war mode. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> I don't know. 37% of employees in our survey say their companies are not always vigilant about managing these types of environments, often resulting in profit and growth coming at the expense of values and ethics. In fact, this is an area where employees rank their employers the lowest and identify the biggest opportunity to improve. Unrealistic deadlines, overly aggressive sales targets, and poorly structured incentive systems can lead people to take extreme and often illegal measures to deliver business results. This is an area where employees rank their employers the lowest and identify the biggest opportunity to improve. In addition to better regulating the burdens placed on employees, some companies are building the resilience of their peoples so they can better handle difficult situations. Which is a fancy way of saying, get a thicker skin? Is that how it is? Nope. These efforts range from providing on-site support services during busy seasons to appointing wellness officers tasked with tending to employees' emotional and physical well-being to providing training that gives staff a decision-making framework so they can leverage to make ethical choices in high-stakes situations. And last but not least, number six, risk to culture being toxic and being an issue within your company, unclear ethical standards. The final predictor of cultural risk is unclear ethical standards. Our research shows that company values, which should provide a North Star for employee behavior, but are often just on the wall for those platitudes look good. You know, one of my favorite, one of my favorite, um, uh, you know, those uh, in inspirational uh, posters that you see in corporate walls, right? One of my favorite, um, is is a, a picture of like, I think it's like five or six forks. And then like one of the forks is bent and all screwed up in the middle. So it's fork, fork, bent fork, 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 right? 
I love this one because it says, just because you're different doesn't mean you're useful. <laughs> uh, okay. I know, guys, it wasn't. I... Nope. Emerging from a very public scandal, one of our clients needed to reset expectations of its people and align around a global value system that would transcend geographic boundaries and local cultural norms. That almost seems impossible. Their approach, it, 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 man, is that really possible? I've worked with companies that span multiple cultures, English cultures, American cultures, Indian cultures, Asian cultures, European cultures, right? And I've traveled to all these different places. I'm gonna tell you that it is almost impossible to make sure a set of core values that aren't just so generalized and, 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 and blanketed terms that can really speak to all these nuanced, aesthetic, and highly idiosyncratic um, cultures out there. So if you, if you guys know, you guys know of a cultural, uh, of a company's cultural values that can transcend global cultures. You let me know. You will impress me greatly. You will impress Lee greatly. Their approach, engaging employees globally and co-creating five core values that would drive critical behavior shifts and resonate with each market around the world. The question really is, is does it resonate? Of course, having values, principles, or beliefs is just the first step. Enabling and enforcing them is what will ultimately lower cultural risk. With a deep network of employee culture ambassadors, an annual Global Values Week, and ongoing values-driven internal communication, the company has been able to keep its shared beliefs top of mind. Well, that was one of those articles that I definitely felt like I need, needed to cover. And the reason is because cult, the culture crisis or the culture wars is always going to be upon us. If you're a founder, if you're a venture capitalist, if you're an entrepreneur, if you are a leader of a company, it is so important to ensure that you, 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 nobody else, guys, nobody else, nobody else. It's just you. It's just you. Just you. You are the leader. You are the cultural norm trend setter. You are the behavior model for your company. Know this, understand this, realize how important this is. And I promise you, I promise you, you will have a great culture. You will have a wonderful culture if you yourself can be the most disciplined to being, well, to be a good person. Yeah, <laughs> a word from our sponsor, guys. Through Startup Story, guys, you got it. Your company just got seed round financed. Congratulations, you're going to the moon. But now you have to scale. You found great talent out in California, New York, Georgia, and even Eastern Europe. So what communications platform will you be using to ensure your international team is always aligned? Well, the answer is easy. Slack.com for teams. We've used Slack for all of our previous startups and they've supported us in tremendous ways. And we wanna give them a thanks today for supporting vchunting.com. Did you also know that Slack is a great tool for personal use? Yeah, I use my own personal Slack channel to drop in documents, notes, to-dos, and follow-ups to ensure that my workflow throughout the day is right on course. I promise you, if you try out slack.com for personal use, you'll end up using it for your team as well. Go to slack.com to check it out. And for our segment, for all those who are interested in what's going on in the world of venture deals, here's my VC hunting venture deals master list. The venture deals for December 11th. Listen up for those who, are, who got me on podcast on iTunes, Spreaker, all sorts of different places. Listen up and see where the money's going today. You and Mr. Jones, a New York-based developer and distributor of content that helps businesses build brands, raised $200 million cha-ching in Series B funding at a valuation of $1.3 billion. Investors included Bailey Gifford. Wow. Imperative Care, a Campbell, California-based company focused on stroke treatments, raised $85 million. Congratulations in Series C funding, Allie Bridge. Group and Bain Capital Life Sciences co-led the round and was joined by others. Passport, a Charlotte, North Carolina-based mobility management platform, raised $65 million. In Series D funding, investors include Rowe Capital Partners, HIG Growth Partners, and Thorntree Capital Partners. 
CyberGRX, a Denver-based provider of global cyber risk exchange, raised $40 million in Series D funding. Iconic Capital led the round and was joined by investors including Allegis Cyber and Bessemer Venture Partners. Savan Multisite Solutions, a Downer Grove, Illinois-based provider of construction management services, raised $17.5 million in a Series A. Congratulations, getting off the ground here, guys. ABS Capital Partners led the round. Fintech OS, a Romania-based company focused on hyper-personalized automated financial technology, raised 10.7 million pounds, 14 million in Series A funding. Early Birds Digital East Fund and OTB Ventures led the round. Ooh, Romania, hyper-personalized automated financial technology? Let's check this out. What is this all about? Fintech, hyper-personalized. Fintech is transform. okay, yes. Closed systems and out-of-the-box open source automotive technology makes hyper-personalization and hyper-speed a reality in weeks. We're making data the new core. Ooh, look at this, 20 plus pre-packed Fintech automation processors. Seems legit, guys. Seems legit. Current Health, a UK-based artificial intelligence-powered patient management platform, raised $11.5 million in Series A funding. Congratulations to them. Uh, MMC Part Ventures led the round. Yumi, a France-based, science-based nutrition and meal delivery company for children, raised $8 million in funding. Investors include Warby Parker, Allbirds, Harry's, Sweet Green, Sweet Green, ooh, Yumi. Let's check this out, guys. What's this all about? Yumi, look at this. Your favorite fruits tailored to your growing babe. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that, that, that baby, okay. That's funny. That's a fun gift, guys. That's a, that's a, that's a fun gift. Embrace, a Culver City, California-based performance monitoring and analytics platform built for mobile apps, raised $7.5 million in Series A funding. AV8 Ventures led the round. Tribal, a provider of business cards for startups, raised $5.5 million in seed funding. Beko Capital and Global Ventures co-led the round and was joined by investors including Endure Capital, Tribal. Ooh, this is a lot of, un a lot of fun startups are getting funded today, guys. Business credit card for your startup. Traditional banks don't understand startups? We do. Well, looks like you guys need to check out Tribal Credit. Gasu.ai, a Russia-based developer of ai driven video coach, raised 2.8 million in funding. Bright Eye Ventures led the round, congratulations. <laughs> Blue Point Capital par Partners acquired a Matco Forge, a Paramount California-based maker in Forge metal products, primarily for the aerospace and defense industry. Ooh, money, money. Payne Schwartz Partners made an investment in Warburton Technology, a producer of trace material injections for cattle. If you like that beef, guys, do it bigly. Uh, Farm MedQuest, which is backed by Kinderhook Industries, acquired Long Pharma Pharmacy Solutions, a, a Columbia, South Carolina-based provider in pharmacy management services. Summa Capital made an investment in Implica Education, a Spain-based company focused on professional and vocational training. Gravity, a company backed by Clear Lake Capital Group, acquired On Point Oil Field Holdings, an Austin, Texas-based oil fields fluid waste solutions company. Ooh, that's sexy. Gravity, a company backed by Clear Lake Capital Group, acquired On Point Oil Fields. Oh, I already read that. Uh, Marlin Equity Partners acquired Logical Wear, a Scotland-based provider of multi-tenant cloud-based email automation, workflow management, and customer service ticketing solution. And last but not least, Harvard's partners acquired LaserSpot and Alpharetta. Oh! <laughs> you guys, you guys thought you were like, what? What is happening here? It's Georgia. You know I gotta represent Georgia. I'm out here in Atlanta, Georgia, guys. Harvard's partners acquired LaserSpot and Alpharetta, Georgia. Congratulations. <laughs> of outsourced yard management services. Financial terms weren't disclosed as the seller was Greenbrier Equity Group. Well, congratulations to all the venture deals out there. You guys see, money is moving. And we got some interesting ones today. Yumi Tribal. Tribal is cool. Business cards for startups. Not bad.
did you know that there's even more value than just audio or video? Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, at VC Hunting, and make sure to sign up for the VC Hunting newsletter, where you'll be able to get weekly news on venture capital, startups, founder stories, and the occasional wisdom extracted from Peter's brain. Go to vchunting.com to sign up. And now back to the episode. Ooh, so what happened here? Let's just close that down. There we go. Guys, we are on to our last segment here. It's Ask Peter. What's up, guys? Ask a PETA. Now, this is a new segment. I don't know if I'm going to be doing this all the time, but this is, I just want to find, well, the reason is because I got, a, I got an email. I got a DM, not an email, a DM. I got a DM from Jason, and he gave me an idea because I get a lot of, a lot of questions from founders. I get a lot of questions from entrepreneurs and people who are starting their hustle and their grind, um, and I want to use this section, this section for answering any questions from founders or aspiring founders or entrepreneurs or anyone in the hustle. I am a three times, uh, three time founder. I've had an exit before. I've had gone through the, the, the seed, ra- seed, seed rounds and, and, and venture rounds, all these types of things. So I have a little, uh, a little bit of experience. I'm not ridiculously, uh, uh, you know, a super, super, what's the word I want to use? an expert. I would never consider myself an expert in anything, really. Um, I'm multifaceted, like everybody else. But other than that, I just want to help. I just want to help. So this is an opportunity for me to connect to you guys. Make sure to tweet at me. Make sure to tweet at me. Uh, Join our newsletter. You can always hit reply. You can always ask me questions. I'm all over the internet, whether it's on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, uh, the newsletter. Obviously, you can leave a comment on this video below on YouTube. So connect with me. I want to grow this community. I want to help you guys, especially if you're a founder or you're a venture capitalist. That's like, that's my target market. So if you're a founder or you're a venture capitalist, I want to help you. I want to help you grow and level up. So let's, let's add, let's, let's do our first question, guys. Our first question, this one comes from Jason. He basically asked the question, why don't you focus on cryptocurrency anymore? Well, Jason, thanks so much for our first question on Ask Peter. Ask Peter. Uh, the reason I don't focus on cryptocurrency anymore is because I've shifted my focus. So in the last three and a half years, you guys know, I started a bite-sized Bitcoin channel that went up to about 70,000 subscribers, which has now t- gone down because of uh, the, the unuse and the shadow banning that happened. And then we ended up creating another DC TV, decentralized TV, with about 80,000 subscribers as well. So I was doing uh, videos for the cryptocurrency space over the last three and a half years daily. And so we've shifted. And the reason is, is because the company that I was a part of, well, that I'm no longer a part of, well, I'm still founder, but the, the company, the last company that I was working with, we got our uh, seed, seed round. We got financed. We got venture funding. We got venture financing, guys. And it's moving into a B2B, a business-to-business space. And so I'm not really into the business-to-business space. I'm really into to growing brand new startups. I mean, to growing and building. That's what I do. You guys have seen, especially for those who've been with me for a long time, you guys know that I just love building and creating new things and creating content. Like, I love creating content. You can't, you can't, I'm all over the web, guys. I love it. And so why don't I focus on cryptocurrency anymore is because I'm broadening my scope. Number, number one, well, number one really is because I'm moving out of the crypto space. My previous company is moving into B2B, business to business. It's going to be awesome. Yen.io, make sure that you check it out. But secondly, I want to open up a new project. I want to start a new project. And the project is focused on founders and venture capitalists. I really think there's an opportunity. There's really an opportunity to help founders and venture capitalists grow. This is a huge market with lots of potential and there's not enough being done in terms of the what I call, and make sure that you check out my blog post on vchunting.com uh, slash venture dash media. Go there. Read my blog post on the rise of venture media and why I think it's so important to have better media, better marketing, better reach, better outreach for the venture capital and founder world, mostly venture capital. You see, I believe, and this is kind of um, one of the, the eternal, eternal hopes, and I wrote about this in my, in my last newsletter actually yesterday, but I believe that founders need to be eternally optimistic. 
it's it's just it, it is is it is a required asset. It is a required requirement uh, to be a founder, to be a startup entrepreneur. And the reason is is because you have to have an unending hope that what you're going to do is is going to be a value. What you're going to do is actually going to work, right? Even with the ups and downs, with the, with the, the high highs and the low lows, there has to be an internal uh, eternal optimism that what you're doing has value, what you're doing has impact, what you're doing will be received by the world and will be used, appreciated, right? And so for me, the eternal optimism, uh, one of the internal optimisms that I've always had, and I've talked, I talked a lot about this was now when I was in the crypto game, uh, this eternal optimism is that some of the best ideas, the best ideas, the best ideas, guys, the best ideas are yet to come. They're yet to come. They're, they're by entrepreneurs. They're by founders who don't have access to resources. They don't have access to capital. They don't have access to networks. We need to do more outreach in venture capital. We need to bring our money our all billions of dollars in, in capital that is that is out there for great ideas. This needs to be brought to these founders in remote places, in places that you would never imagine, with ideas that I believe could fundamentally change the world if we connect them. So what am I here to do? I want to be a bridge. I want to be a bridge between founders, entrepreneurs, and hustlers and venture capital. I want to be that bridge. I want to be that bridge that bring, pe bring people to me. I'm, I'm interviewing all these great VCs. I have a huge network of venture capitalists, and I want to create a way that we can introduce, get introductions, get connections happening so that your awesome idea, if you're a founder, right, can be connected with great VCs who will support you and help you build your dreams. Jason, that's why. Jason, that's why I don't focus on cryptocurrency anymore, because I want to deploy more capital into great ideas. So if you like this, send it. Send it to your hustlers. Send it to your friends, the guys who are, who are, who are growing their businesses, small businesses, seed businesses, just new beginnings. And send me, my, send me questions. So the best way to send me questions, sign up for our newsletter. Sign up for our newsletter, and when you get our daily newsletter, hit reply. And you can just say, ask PETA. Ask, you can ask me anything. I'm willing to talk about it because I want to connect with you. I want to grow this community. I want to grow a global community, founders and venture capitalists, so that we can create some awesome type of system so that we can connect them and these ideas can change the world. I like that. Thanks, Jason, for the first question. Guys, thanks for being here and have an awesome, awesome day. Thank you.